So now we come to look at this term adaptogen. We've mentioned adaptogens a few times on the course, and I'm sure that you're all familiar with that term even before you took the entire course. Just because adaptogen has become a bit of a buzzword, and I wanted to look a little bit into the roots of this term because it's actually quite a modern term. In fact, the term adaptogen really emerged out of Russian research in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and the term has evolved quite a lot since then. And there have been reams and reams of research published on the subject. Uh, but despite all of that, there's really no overall consensus to this day about what adaptogen means. So that's the first thing we need to say. I'm not imagining that I can give you the definitive definition of what adaptogen is, because I don't think anybody can. But we will look at some basic ideas around it, and, and I'll tell you what I think it means. And then you'll have to take those ideas into life and see what you think of those. For our purposes, I think it's helpful to think of adaptogens as being herbs which help us to change and adapt our responses. So adapt as in adaptogen. Uh, to adapt our responses to the changing demands, often the stresses of our environment. And that could be our internal environment in a disease state, or it could be our external environment in terms of stress or in terms of um, radiation exposure or, or surgery or something like that. The initial Russian research was essentially fueled by a desire within the communist world to maximize athletic and scientific and intellectual performance in order really to demonstrate the superiority of the communist ideal. And adaptogens were sourced all across the world from different uh, traditional medicine systems, the majority really from TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. And later then many were also explored from Ayurveda, so South Indian uh, traditional medicine. And their effects were then studied in both animals and in human beings. And in humans, they really were looking at the performance of their elite athletes and seeing how they could be enhanced by the use of adaptogens. Athletes obviously being under lots of stress, pushing their bodies to the limits through training and then through a competition. And they were also looking at uh, the performance of their cosmonauts, who obviously need to be in absolute top focus and cognitive uh, ability and physical endurance as they go into space, into the unknown. And they were also looking at using them for their top scientists to see if they could enhance their cognitive abilities um, as they push the boundaries of science in the middle of the 20th century. Adaptions were then used in all these different contexts and various outcomes measured in relation to these plants. And performance then, not simply in the sense of physical performance, but also in the cognitive sense. So that's a very important concept, I think, to have around adaptogens. That when we're under mental stress or emotional stress or physical stress or chemical stress or radiation stress or whatever it is, adaptogens seem to be able to help us cope with all of those different stressors. The initial Russian definitions of adaptogen included the following concepts that an adaption should be non-toxic, that it should produce a broad and non-specific response to stress, and it should have a normalizing influence on physiology. So those were the basic criteria around which the definition of adaption was first constructed. Adaptions might in some ways then be seen as supertonics, and certainly they often have that panacea-like aura around them, certainly in the public mind, and I think that's where the problems start to creep in around adaptogen use. Panacea, though, is actually not too far from the truth. Indeed, many adaptogens appear to enhance multiple functions of a vast array of tissues and organs and systems. So we talked about tissue tonics and organ tonics and system tonics. Well, adaptogens do all of that as well, really. Since those original Russian studies in the 1950s and 60s and so on, modern research has added to those original Russian concepts around what an adaptation might be and how it might achieve its effect. So to qualify as an adaptogen, it's been suggested uh, that a herb must enhance energy production, must enhance blood sugar control, must enhance immune function and cognition and adrenal function, 
reproductive function and on and on and on and on. In, in other words, pretty much wherever you look, you should be seeing enhancement of function. Key scientific findings include the idea that adaptogens increase intracellular energy production. So right down at cell level, the actual cells that make up the tissues, that make up the organs, that make up the systems. So right down at the very deepest level, um, there's an enhancement of, of intracellular energy production. So I think that's a key concept for adaptogens. So that's one theory as to how they might work. Other theories include the concept that adaptogens might induce minor stresses in the body, which wake up more efficient responses then to the actual stresses that, they're, that that person or that organ or that tissue or system is facing. And, and it can wake up more efficient responses to a, a non-specific range of stresses. So that's another key theory. And that one's more recent, so that's quite a modern take on what adaptions might be doing. Another prevalent theory is that they primarily enhance adrenal function via the central control areas of the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary that then communicate with the adrenal glands. I think it's important to pause there and say that this last theory um, is potentially problematic, I find, as a herbalist. So that this adrenal theory of, of adaptogens really entails a narrower definition, uh, I find, and that definition then fails to account for the wider influences that adaptogens clearly have in the body. And I think it's led to many mistakes in contemporary understanding of adaptogens, and it's led to a whole range of products available for sale which are sold really as adrenal tonics, which are not. So I'm going to dive deeper into that in a, in a minute to try and underline and highlight where I think the concern might lie. There are many other theories as to how adaptogens might work in the body. Thousands of papers written on it and more and more all the time and many, many books that have also been written on the subject. In the end, it's probably true to say that each of the theories I mentioned has got something to offer to the overall understanding of this very complex group of herbs. So I mentioned some problems around the understanding of the word adaptogen, and I think I've got to be honest and say that I think the herbal world has partly been responsible for the problematic understanding of adaptogens in the current decade. In recent decades, some herbalists have started expanding the range of herbs that they are considering and terming an adaptogen. And to my mind, many of the herbs that are included have actually a much narrower range of focus and really are tonics. So I think this is the problem uh, in my mind that we're getting tonics now being called adaptogens and I think they're clearly different things. Before I go any further, let me just underscore the fact that this is my personal opinion and there are certainly different opinions within the herbal world. So you have to read those and hear other people's opinions and take mine and eventually make your own mind up. So don't to, to push it too hard, but let me just tell you why I think it's potentially problematic. So I was saying to you a few moments ago how one of the definitions that we might think of around adaptions is they help us to adapt to stressors. So while borage is offered as an adaptogen, and while it does offer adrenal support, it doesn't enhance reproductive function, it doesn't enhance immunological responses, it doesn't do all those other many things that, are, that I think a true adaptogen should do. So it's a tonic, it's an adrenal tonic, it's got a much narrower focus. So yes, it helps us with stress, yes, it helps us adapt to stress, because the adrenals do that, but it doesn't do all these other things. So to my mind, it doesn't truly qualify as an adaptogen. This is an important consideration, which I'll say a bit more about later on as well, because borage doesn't have this kind of wide panacea, super tonic-like effect that a real obvious adaptogen like ginseng has, where pretty much everywhere you look in the body, you pick up a pile of studies or you get them off the internet and you see studies looking at immune function and at, at cardiac issues and at cancer and there's just a million different things. Pretty much anywhere you choose to look, you see benefits from using Panax if you use it in the right way. So Panax ginseng we'll talk about later. That's what I think an adaptogen should do. It should, if, if an adaptogen is working at that very tiny cell level, it's going to influence every tissue type in the body and every system in the body. So you should be able to find evidence of enhancement wherever you look. I just don't think you see that with borage. From a practitioner's point of view, 
Adaptogens have become problematic, I find, in recent years, mainly because of what's going on in the health food stores. So the health food stores are full of, of adaptogen-based products, which are often poorly designed, inappropriately marketed, I find, and which consumers often end up using to their own detriment. So let me explain what I mean by this. Adaptogens are powerful herbs, and individual adaptions have very unique and clearly distinct characters, if you like, characteristics that need to be understood for their appropriate use. So you can't just put a bunch of adaptogens in one formula and then throw it at somebody and hope that things are gonna be all right. This, these are powerful herbs. When a patient shows me a health store bottle of adaptogen capsules, I'm expecting almost always to pick it up, read the ingredients, and see what to my mind is just a completely nonsensical grab bag of adaptogens, many of which have quite contradictory characteristics, and some of which may be totally inappropriate for that person uh, at that time for their specific problem. I've lost count quite a long time ago of the number of times when I've asked a patient to stop using that bottle of adaptogens, and I will choose one or maybe two specifically tailored for them and leave the other ones to one side because this formula that they've picked up is actually causing them a problem. And as a professional, I know why. In some quarters, adaptogens have become truly herbs of abuse, I find, in the modern day. We live in a society where we generally think more is always more and enough is never enough. And we're always stretching to achieve more, to have more, to experience more. It's our modern world disease of overconsumption and excess in all kind of senses, emotionally and physically and, and financially and all sorts of other ways. And in that worldview, which is kind of a, quite insidious, I think, for most of us, because we live in it, that's the ocean in which we're swimming every day. And in this worldview, adaptogens really have become tools with which we can attempt to overextend ourselves. And I think this is the problem, because we live in a society where we're often overextending ourselves already. I commonly see patients who are already working inhuman hours, using adaptogens to push and push and push beyond all reasonable human limits into a point of exhaustion. This cannot be healthy. I would prefer to see adaptogens more appropriately used to help people get through defined periods of, of difficulty. So periods, temporary periods of stress or, or physical or emotional stress. Um, rather than trying to maintain those states as the norm. So I think that's the problem in a culture like ours, where we, our normal is often pushing us to the edge all the time. The most concerning scenario that I regularly see through clinics at college and in my own private practice experience is people in genuine long-term stress and fatigue and burnout. So some of those might overlap with what we sometimes term as chronic fatigue syndrome or breakdown or these kind of terms as well. And these are often patients who are grabbing an adaptogen capsule blend from the health food store to help them get through and who end up actually compounding the very problem that they're trying to solve. And it's because adaptogens by their very nature fire up cell level activity in all sorts of tissues and systems. That's the problem because they may end up actually depleting the tiny bits of energy that that person is holding on to for dear life and just burning it out, kind of flaring it off so that it's all gone and now the person deeply crashes. And I've seen patients do this to themselves with these adaptogens. In a situation like that, especially in an adrenal kind of depletion story, then we want a really pointy tonic like borage. So this is again, to my mind, evidence that borage isn't an adaption. You give somebody Panax in that, that kind of not getting out of bed, chronic fatigue situation, and it's just gonna burn off all their energy and they'll be even more exhausted than they were. You give somebody borage, which is very pointily an adrenal tonic and perhaps a nerve tonic as well, we might consider it that too it really gently supports in a much more focused way the very organs and tissues that are depleted without spending the body's limited energy all over the place inappropriately. So that's where you want a tonic in, in contrast to an adaptogen which might be problematic. 
So I hope you're getting the sense of where then a, a tonic and an adaptogen differ. So tonic's having a much more limited focus, maybe even for a particular tissue, maybe a bit wider for an organ, a whole organ, or maybe for a whole system, but not for everything. Whereas adaptogens have this much wider role of being able to kind of support everything in a, in a more profound way. Okay, so while adaptogens then have this ability to play all sorts of roles in the body, and play most of them well. It's also true to say that each of them has a very unique character too, and a certain set of strengths. So although they're able to do a bit of everything, so in a sense they are that panacea kind of thing, they each have a unique role to play too. And that's what we're gonna look at next. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through six key adaptogens, looking at them one by one, and just very simply contrasting what the differences are between them.